Hey you, I'm getting quite used to having you around. It's Lucy Luck, and I like to play non-traditional cozy games and make them cozy. Today, in this narrated chapter of my evil playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3, we are making our way towards Act 2. So without further ado, get comfy cozy, pop on some headphones if you like, and let's go on an adventure. If you're new here, or happened to fall asleep before the end of my last video, here's a quick recap. I got a weird worm put in my brain, made some other worm-infested friends, did some evil stuff that made half my new friends mad, and the remaining friends and I had a big party to celebrate how evil we were. Please note that I'm not actually evil in real life, and everything I do in this playthrough isn't easy for me. Also, if you get mad at me, I will cry. Thankfully, being evil has its perks though, and my devious Riz attracted three potential love interests. Astarian, Lazel, and Menthara. But because I wanted to be fancy and build suspense, I ended my last video there. So this is where we begin today's adventure. After much consideration, I decide to romance Menthara. Unfortunately, due to the ridiculous amount of modding I've done, most of the cutscene is blocked by my wings, and also by this barrel full of loot. The wing thing is kind of a common theme throughout the playthrough, so buckle up. We have to embrace it now. But after an evening full of romance, Manthara and I snuggle up inside the modded loot barrel, and I can't help but notice something seems off. Manthara is afraid, so I decide to do what any good lover would do, and pry. It seems this woman hasn't been able to catch a break for a while now, so she has a lot of unresolved trauma. As we emerge from the barrel, I tell her there is more to her than I thought. She holds the same sentiment, going on to note the Absolute fell silent when we were together. When she inquires about how that's possible, the artifact becomes fearful, since it isn't in anyone's best interest to spill all of the saucy details about having the artifact everyone's after. I just tell her the Absolute isn't what she thinks it is. This statement makes her a bit nervous though, and she urges me to keep quiet as the Absolute might hear. I tell her the Absolute can't reach her when she's with me, and although she's still fearful, it seems she's slowly beginning to realize the Absolute may not be what she thought. Okay, well, maybe not, as I awaken with her knife at my throat. I really thought we were getting somewhere, but it turns out the lack of the Absolute's voice sent her spiraling, and her only solution became to kill me. Thankfully, some sort of miracle happened, and the Absolute tasked her with determining if I'm worthy. Worthy of what? I don't know but I don't feel like dying, so I just play along. I persuade Menthara that we are both worthy, and that we must go to the Absolute together. Thankfully, that's a solid choice, so she urges me to travel to Moonrise and meet her there. She also explains that the lands ahead are cursed, but with the help of a vile creature in her service, I can be guided through it. Before she departs, she gives me a super nifty harp to play in order to summon him, and we begin to make our way to the mountain pass. Now, I could be lying straight towards the Shadow Cursed Lands, but I'm in a bit of a situation ship with Lazel. She's been quite adamant that we investigate the nearby Githyanki crash in order to remove our brainworms. Because these brainworms give me incredible powers, 
I haven't necessarily made that a priority, but although I'm evil, I do have a bit of a soft spot for all of my girlfriends and boyfriends. Along the trail through the mountain pass, we stumble across a woman by the name of Lady Esther. Although I didn't ask her to, she kindly points out the nearby crash, because apparently there's beef there. Not surprisingly, the Githyanki are not very nice, and they slaughtered just about everyone to inhabit the temple. I thought Lady Esther would be seeking some sort of revenge, but she just wants one of their eggs for research purposes. Lazel doesn't like this very much, so I tell Lady Esther I won't be getting involved. Instead, we all make our way to the nearby cable car, which I'm barely strong enough to operate, and we take a nice ride down to the temple. As we approach the doors, a cutscene ensues, where we see Githyanki raiders pestering a group of absolute cultists. It seems all of this might have something to do with the artifact we carry. The cultists express that they don't have it, but the Githyanki mean business and completely no-scope a cultist when they try to flee. Lazel says we must proceed carefully, and that is a bit of an understatement if you ask me. I try to get through the doors they literally just passed through, but I can't, and lockpicking is also out of the question. Instead, we enter the building through a nearby broken window and stumble into some sort of nest of sleepy, drunken kobolds. Because I have zero faith in my entire crew's ability to be sneaky, I just decide to fight them all. I don't even know if these kobolds were going to be aggressive, but my social battery is low, so this beats having a conversation. Thankfully, the fight wasn't too bad, but since I'm no longer playing on easy mode, we all need a bit of a nap after that. Upon setting up camp and preparing sleepy time, I am once again confronted by the enigmatic dream visitor. He expresses admiration that I've been making use of our tadpole's power, but states we've been looking in all the wrong places to be rid of it. I decide to press him once again about who he is, and he says it's complicated. He claims to be an adventurer as well, one that was also infected with a mind flare parasite, and just like us, he seeks to be free of it. He goes on to state that in order for us to do so, we will need to destroy the source of our tadpole's magic. Magic that prevents its removal. I ask the dream visitor to tell me more about this magic, and he explains that it imbues the parasites with special powers. This is what gives us extraordinary abilities, but also what leads true soul cultists to hear the voice of the Absolute and believe it to be a god. When the order to transform is given, anyone with a tadpole will become mind flayers in an instant. He goes on to state that if it weren't for his protection, so would we. I ask why I should believe him, and he says because we share a common cause. While I can go where he cannot, and he can protect us from the Absolute's influence, we can work together to take down the Absolute. Suddenly, he has to get back to whatever it was he was doing before, so I make sure to ask what exactly is going on over there. Finally, I get some sort of answer as he admits that he stole the power he uses to protect us, and that they want it back. He says, sooner or later, he will become worn down, so we must use our powers to convince the cult of the Absolute we're one of them, find the source of their magic, and destroy it. The conversation concludes as he states that our freedom depends on it. Once again, I wasn't the only one to receive this dream visit, but we all more or less agree with the plan to infiltrate the cult and discover what powers are at large. Okay, well, everyone but Lazo. 
she doesn't trust this guy one bit, and still seems adamant about removing the tadpole herself in the crash. Because I'm not above perusing all of our options, we leave camp and make our way through the temple and into the basement. It's here that we finally discover the Githyanki crash, where we are briskly halted by Gish Verong. These names, though. She wasn't expecting visitors, so she's a little on edge. I let Lazelle take the lead in this conversation, and she explains she's here as one of Flacketh's faithful for purification. Thankfully, this was difficult for the guard to argue with, and we are told to make our way to the infirmary. Once inside, we make the acquaintance of a Gustil Stornigos? Sure. Gustil Stonygrass seems to be studying tadpoles, but doesn't seem so keen on us gawking. I once again encourage Lazel to speak on my behalf, and she tells the doctor of our predicament. She seems fascinated that we are infected, but not impaired, and encourages us to go to the Sathisk, which I can only assume is this giant machine in the middle of the room. Lazelle is super stoked about this gross contraption, so I let her go on ahead, but not before very poorly examining it. She hops right in, and I'm getting a bad feeling about this, especially considering that the dream visitor just told us any attempts to remove the tadpole will kill us. Turns out my brilliant and ill-timed instincts are correct as even the narrator makes it known this thing will kill her. Thanks to a lot of deception checks with advantage actions, I was able to do absolutely nothing. I'm guessing the dream visitor intervened, though, and just blew the whole thing up. Lazel and the doctor both did not seem very pleased with this. The doctor now bordering on mania really wants our special tadpoles, so I use my incredible powers of deception to once again do nothing. She sees right through the lies, and says she will return with tools to remove it. In the meantime, I strike up a chat with Lazel, and she's infuriated that the device almost killed her, and she believes the doctor must be a traitor. She goes on to suggest we must inform the Chitrai the doctor's misdeeds, I think that's the Inquisitor. Now, I don't think this doctor has our best interests at heart, but I also don't think she's a traitor just because that weird mouth machine couldn't remove a magic tadpole. With that being said, though, I decide to make a starry and lockpick the door and loot the place before we make our way out of here. Unfortunately, the doctor was not simply getting tools to remove our tadpoles, and we run into one hell of a fight on the way out, and all die. I try again with Shadowheart instead of Gale, and this time everyone dies except me. Perfect. I head to camp to put Withers to work, resurrect all of my companions, and we've all earned a little nap. Turns out a brush with death doesn't dampen the romantic mood around here so Lazel has come to get a little freaky. I nervously say I am ready, and she does not make me feel any less nervous. We magically appear outside, and she starts courting me by telling me she can lift. I cannot show you the rest of this scene, because she immediately gets nudie spaghetti. I don't know why I phrased it like that, after all of the romance, my character's in pain, and Lazel just dips. I also don't remember equipping this underwear. The next morning, the squad and I head out to talk to the Inquisitor, and there's, like, a bunch of people in there. I recognize Chitrai as being the Inquisitor, but I don't know who this lady is. She seems insistent that the artifact must be at Moonrise and her warriors are ready to attack, so I guess that makes her a general? Frog president? Regardless, the other guy doesn't seem to care, 
as long as the prism is found. As the cutscene ends, we move into the captain's quarters, so she must be Frog Captain. I also notice the room is red, so this could end very badly. She's mad I'm not also a frog, but asks if we have the weapon. The dream visitor insists that we don't tell her anything, so I lead with Lazel's whole traitorous doctor bit. Lazel backs me up on this, but when we demand to speak with the Inquisitor about it, she accuses us of vague allegations and undue demands. She also notes this is especially bad as a non-fellow frog, the very same said to hold the weapon they seek. I find this to be rather ignorant, considering there are at least ten other people that aren't Githyanki and Faerun, but the only options I have are to hand it over or fight. I choose to fight, and we all die. I decide to start the whole thing over, but this time disguised as Frog. Unfortunately, the uh, dress I was wearing was a mod that does not work on Githyanki body types, so yeah, this is a look. She says I'm not familiar to her, and I suppose someone dressed in only lingerie and a cape would be fairly memorable. <laughs> Regardless, I ask for a description of the weapon they seek to play along. I quickly regret asking because Shadowheart does not have the poker face that I do. I use deception to once again do nothing, but I've had it up to here with that, so I scum save and try again. This time it works, thank the gods, but she says return with the weapon or do not return at all. I decide to try the conversation again as an elf and it goes about the same way. Now I think I've figured it out. If I make a starian hide, pickpocket the general. Maybe I can. Oh wait, no, I didn't want to talk to her, pickpocket her. Okay, you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna try to fight her again. Thankfully, we succeed this time. Yoink the stone and place it on the thingy. The voice on the other end states we have business to conduct, and so we make our way inside. Inside the Inquisitor's chambers, he seems pleased to make Lazel's acquaintance, as well as my own since I slayed a bunch of druids for no reason. This guy knows, without a doubt, we have the weapon and asks for it. Because I'm not too keen on becoming a big purple octopus, I say nuh-uh, and Lazel's pissed. She even says she will kill me which is pretty rude considering we just did love stuff. I urge her to remember the big bad mouth machine, and that these gaith can't be trusted. She ultimately supports my decision to deny the Inquisitor, and we rear our heads for the battle of our lives, and all die. I try again, and we die. Then I try to replace Shadowheart with Gale, and this time Gale dies, but at least the rest of us make it out. After our victory, Vlacketh herself speaks and reveals herself to us. Lazel is flabbergasted and very excited by the fact Vlacketh simply knows her name. Her queen goes on to promise Lazel purification if she is to cleanse the astral prism of corruption. Unfortunately, since I was a little half dead, Lazel was the one to do all of the talking, and she agreed without hesitation. Blacketh went on to explain, there is someone within the prism whose mind is warped and broken. An agent of the grand design sent to sabotage the Githyanki's last defense against the Illithid Empire. She tells Lazel, if she kills the one inside, she will not only purify her, but help her ascend. I don't know what that means, but once again I have no say, and Lazel doesn't waste a second to say she will do it. I become a little bit miffed at this when Blacketh states, 
We have to do it before leaving this room, or she will kill us all. Thanks, Lazelle. Now that the cutscene is over, I revive Gale and begrudgingly make my way over to the prism. It opens with ease, and we are all transported into the astral plane as we've all dreamt it. Now the only thing left to do is leap through space and time to approach a beckoning cave. As we do, the dream visitor invites only myself inside, urging me to leave my companions behind. A Starian doesn't seem to want to go in anyway, so bye I guess. He could totally kill me in here, but whatever. The dream visitor is clearly feeling betrayed, stating he may have made a mistake trusting me. Now I know this man could very well be an agent of the Grand Design, here to rule the world with an army of illithid soldiers, hell-bent on the destruction of mankind as we know it. But I made him so handsome, though. I tell him I'm just here to talk. Pleased with this response, he asks what I want to know. Giggling and kicking my feet, I once again ask who he really is, and he just gives me the same response as usual. But this time, he notes that he knows Flacketh's secret. A secret that could end her. He's well aware that she warned us he would try to deceive me. But he asks that I consider what reason he would have to do so. He urges me once again that he simply wants freedom from the Absolute. In a show of good faith, he takes out his sword and presents it to me. I tell him to get up since he's such a little cutie patootie, and he's grateful. Just in case you're all thinking I've broken character here, and spared him because he's pretty. I'll have you know, I'm just being a silly goober. The reality is, this man has proven more useful to me than anyone in the playthrough so far. Therefore, I feel it is in my best interest to make use of him as an ally in order to one day dominate Faerun. However, if Flacketh herself doesn't kill me, I know Lazel will, so I decide to ask more questions about the Queen's secret. He states that the Queen has been lying to the Githyanki about her ability to defeat the Mind Flayer Empire, the power to resist a lithid control, which the Queen only pretends to know, is how our dream visitor protects us. He states that if her people knew it was not her power, she would quickly be overthrown. It's now clear that Flacketh wanted this man dead, so she could harness the power for herself and remain in control. I thought asking questions would be helpful, but now I'm just more aware Flacketh will want us all dead. After leaving the cave, I'm immediately confronted by Lysel, and I'm also worried about how this will play out. I tell her I'm not going to kill him, since he protects us from the Absolute, and enraged, she seeks entrance into my mind. I open my mind to her, because that's way easier than describing what just happened. She describes the dream visitor's words as blasphemy and urges us to leave. Once we exit the astral prism, Lazel really seems to be going through it, hoping this was all just a trial, and she may yet gain her queen's favor. I tell her she must accept that she's an enemy of her people now, and I think she's in agreement she needs time to think. Since we've all been through quite a lot up to this point, I think we've earned a nap so I head to the nearest area that's not red and make camp. Surprisingly, no one seems to need to talk to me, so we all sleep and get back out there. We fight our way out of the Githyanki crush, and since that was the last thing on our to-do list for Act 1, I decide it's about time we head to the end of the mountain pass. We fight some guys along the way, find an interesting letter, and come across an old wizard. Gale seems all too familiar with the wizard, and being the big fat nerd I am, I too recognize a Merlin figure when I see one. This is Elminster, 
and he comes bearing news for our all too often neglected good boy. But first, he wants wine and cheese, and I can't help but respect this man's hustle. I now want nothing more than to frequent hiking trails, promising every passerby to find news in exchange for a good brie. But enough about me. After making Elminster sufficiently fat and sassy, he tells Gale he's here on behalf of his goddess Mistra. I ask him to speak fast, as none of this pertains to me, and turns out it does pertain to me. It pertains to me in a big way, because our boy here didn't think to mention that he's a living time bomb that could have at any moment blown us all up. Not quite the goody two-shoes we thought he was, so now I'm intrigued. Elminster goes on to inform us, Gale did it to himself, and for his crimes, the goddess Mistra abandoned him. Now being faced with the cult of the absolute, Mistra offers him a chance at redemption by sending Elminster to charge Gale with its destruction. Now here's where it gets interesting. She's granted Elminster the power to stop the ticking time bomb that is Gale's chest, to allow him to combust at will. What does this mean? Mistra wants Gale to explode himself at the heart of the Absolute as a way to say sorry. After adjusting the orb, Elminster charges me with the task of taking care of Gale. Because I'm not his keeper, I choose not to accept the charge, but Gale makes me feel a little bad when he says he doesn't blame me. Elminster says goodbye to his old friend, and I beeline my way to the explosive wizard boy to demand some answers. There was much to discuss, but the gist is he and the goddess Mistra used to be lovers, and now the fact she tasked him to blow himself up makes this way funnier to me. Anyway, although he shared a bed with an actual goddess, he still wasn't satisfied and wanted to prove himself worthy. Worthy of what? No idea. But he obtained a book with a fragment of raw magic to impress her, I guess. He then invites me to touch his chest in order to show me what happened next. All of this could have been an email, but I allow it, and he proceeds to get real dramatic with it. Within his vision, I see the book through Gale's eyes as it opened into a swirling mass of dark magic. It quickly lurched towards him, with its sinister claws digging deeper and deeper into his very essence, hungry for more. This force became the orb now in his chest that could erupt to level an entire city. I decide to chat with my favorite gossiping companion about the whole matter, and he can't believe Gail would keep such a big secret from us all. It's not like a Starian would ever do such a thing. With that out of the way, we can finally make our way to the Shadow Cursed Lands. If you're still watching at this point, I want to say thank you so much. We've long passed the average watch time I typically get, so that means you're above average and very special. That or it means I'm doing a very bad job at helping you sleep. But regardless, I'm truly grateful you're here. If you're enjoying this content, feel free to like and subscribe if you haven't already. I also have a Patreon, but I'll talk about that more at the end of the video. Until then, I look forward to the rest of this adventure with you. Upon crossing the threshold, the game really thinks we ought to have one last sleepover, so we had to get some rest. As I begin to try for some shut-eye, I become convinced there isn't a single person in Faerun that wants me to be well rested. I'm promptly awoken by this guy, but he insists he's come to aid us. The dream visitor isn't stoked on this, 
but we decide to at least hear him out. Kithrak Voss is well aware the prism we carry is the key to Vlacketh's demise, and turns out he's all about that. Lazelle still in a bit of denial about where her loyalty should lie, but Voss goes on to say he knows someone at Baldur's Gate who may be able to help us free whoever's inside the prism to end her reign. Lazelle expresses that she is still devoted to her queen, as she's promised to cure and ascend her. Voss makes it known that there is no purification or ascension. The purification device only extracts memory and kills the infected, and Vlaggeth's ascended become fodder for the queen to grow her power and pursue godhood. Lazelle finally begins to see the truth in what Voss is saying, and agrees to meet him in Baldur's Gate. As a parting gift, Voss gives us a psionic detector that will notify us if we come near any of the Queen's warriors. The next morning, we leave camp and find ourselves on the precipice of the Shadow Curse. From the dark emerges a goblin who inquires if I'm the true soul. I ask her who wants to know, and she takes that as a resounding yes, and insists we grab torches as we make our way towards our dark allies. With our torches now at the ready, the goblin warns us that while the torches may help with the shadows, there will be cursed enemies ahead. We swiftly make our way towards the nearest light, where we can become acquainted with Minthara's connections. We see a goblin warrior by the name of Gronog, who tosses a bone into the shadows for a hyena to fetch. The curse quickly engulfs the hyena whole which seems to delight the warrior. I inform him Minthara sent me, and he tells me to speak to Kansif. Before I go to make his acquaintance, I order the goblin warrior to fetch the bone he threw, and then make my merry way. Kansif says it's an honor to meet me, and asks if I brought the lyre. With Minthara's instrument in hand, I play a dark, little tune to summon our guide. From the shadows emerges a daunting figure, bearing an impressive glowing lantern. Astarian notes this man, Karnas, is a creature of Lolth, the queen of spiders. Upon connecting minds with Karnas, he becomes delighted that I'm a true soul and displays little concern for personal boundaries. I want to tell him what a delightful abomination he is, but he seems a little unpredictable, so instead I ask how he survives in the shadows. He boasts that he has the queen's favor, protection, and blessing, but a nearby goblin informs us it's just the lamp. This comment from the goblin ticks off Spider-Man, but after all pleasantries have been exhausted, I ask him to lead on. Keeping close to Karnas with his enchanted lamp, we are swiftly guided through the shadows, and I begin to realize this is way easier than any of my previous playthroughs. Along the path towards Moonrise, our spider friend begins to detect something's off, and urges whoever is lurking to come forth. Suddenly, a group of harpers emerge who are clearly enemies of the Absolute. While they could be worthwhile allies, that sounds like a lot of work to do, and I'm not about to blow my cover, so I side with the cultists, and we swiftly wipe them out. Karnas describes the Harpers as wretched little things, no better than the shadows, and we continue our journey to Moonrise. Once we have successfully reached the cult's base of operations, we are greeted by a man who says welcome back. I inform him we've never met before, and he notes my mind tastes familiar. 
which is an interesting statement for a number of reasons. We are urged to meet with Disciple Zarel in the Great Hall, so we make our way inside. The dream visitor notes that we've made it. This is where we will learn all the secrets of the Absolute. After selling some of the stuff I've been hoarding, we head towards the Great Hall. Inside, we see Manthara in a heated conversation with Disciple Zarel. It seems they are displeased with our drow friend for failing to obtain the artifact. Manthara blames the goblins for this failure, noting that this wouldn't have happened with drow warriors. Angered by this statement, Zarel asks if Manthara is suggesting that General Thorm, the Absolute's chosen, gave her the wrong soldiers. Panicked, she denies this, and Zarel presses her as to who is to blame. I fight my way into Zarel's mind and urge her to hear Manthara out. Thankfully, this softens her a bit, and she agrees that goblins are imperfect tools prone to failure. Catherick demands Manthara be taken below for someone to consider her fate. After she's been escorted out, the general and disciple turn their attention towards me. They ask me to tell them how the goblins served their cause, and since I plan to side with Manthara in this matter, I inform them they sucked. Catherick seems to trust my statement, saying that he can coddle failure no longer. Emerging from his throne, he gives the command to kill the goblins and one of them is absolutely not having that. In a last-ditch effort to survive, the goblin Dren heaves an axe towards the general. Unfortunately for her, the axe seemed to do just about as much damage as a toothpick, and Catherick promptly squishes her. He then asks that I use my creative genius to discipline the goblins as I see fit, and after Zarel gives me the go-ahead, I do my best to contain my excitement. The goblins ask that I don't do anything drastic, but given that I'm playing as an evil dark urge, the term drastic is a bit of an understatement. I ask that they draw me a nice cozy bath in their own blood, and I'm overcome with a moment of remembrance. I've been here before and used to be greeted as a god within these walls. My fall from grace seems to have something to do with Catherick Thorm, and I must do whatever I can to remember myself once again and remove him from his throne. In order to do that, the Dream Visitor informs me we must also learn the secret to the General's power. It turns out getting impaled by an axe, only to stand right back up again, is no ordinary feat. There's much to do, but the first thing on my mind is to follow up with Zarel upstairs. She asks how I handled the goblins, only to enter my mind abruptly and see it for herself. She's incredibly pleased with my methods of discipline, but I inform her I'm not here to clean up other people's mistakes. My confidence delights her, and she becomes even more eager to peruse my mind. It becomes clear that while she is very excited to bathe in my atrocities, she also aims to search for proof of my faith. I decide to get absolutely silly with it and distract her with impure thoughts about my vampire friend, and Astarian really likes this. Sorel seems to have a thing for vampires too, so we bond a little bit. She goes on to tell me I can have everything I could ever want with the power of the Absolute by serving General Thorm. With that, she tells me she has a mission for me, and the Dream Visitor encourages me to continue playing along. I ask Sorel what I need to do, and she informs me of a relic beneath the Thorm mausoleum that the general needs. They had sent his advisor, Balthazar, to retrieve it, but have since lost contact with him. What I need to do is go there, aid Balthazar, and bring the relic home. 
I ask what exactly this relic is, and she informs me all I need to know is that Catherick needs it. Talking about the relic seems to make Zarel a bit anxious, so I decide to persuade her into explaining why. She states that she's in awe of what power this relic must hold to be of such importance, and I begin to think this may be our key to understanding Catherick's immortality. I tell her I'm down for the task, and she tells me to acquire a moon lantern from Balthazar's chambers. She also makes it a point to note I shouldn't pry in there, so I'm absolutely going to. I beeline to Balthazar's room and snoop away, discovering not only the moon lantern, but a secret room as well. Within the hidden chamber is a book that says the following. I have redirected some materials from beneath the tower. I planned to simply raise what forces I need inside the mausoleum itself, but the general prefers that no more of his family crypts be disturbed. Even so, I may have no choice. The temple will not surrender the Night Song easily, and the general's invulnerability depends on it. I am sure he will forgive a little transgression if it frees the army to move on Baldur's Gate at last. With this, we now know that the General's Relic is called the Night Song, and it is in fact the key to his invulnerability. Within the room, we also stumble across a ritual circle, and I'm really uncertain if it's supposed to be doing this. Regardless, Gale is completely intrigued, noting the sigil appears to have been used in order to create moon lanterns. While the sigil is now mostly drained, he notes that it still contains Shadow Weave, that when combined with the nearby dead pixies, could craft another lantern. This lantern, however, would be different than the one we have in our possession. Instead of repelling the shadows, this new lantern could wield them. Although initially excited about this prospect, Gale quickly becomes disheartened, noting that Mistra would not allow him to use such magic. I tell him to hell with his ex-girlfriend, and urge him to make the naughty lamp. After combining a broken lantern with a very broken pixie, Gale crafts the shadow lantern. Thankfully, there are no signs of divine retribution from Mistra, and we make our way out of the secret room. Before leaving Balthazar's room entirely, a Githyanki disc catches my eye. Engaging with it produces a vision that even Lazel admits to having difficulty understanding. After a bit of time, she's able to solve the pattern, stating that it's a story about someone by the name of Orpheus. It's clear whoever Orpheus is brings a certain amount of discomfort to Lazel, so I ask who he is. She describes him as a dead traitor, and that she can hardly bear to read the text. I tell her she'll bear it just fine, and urge her to tell me what it says anyway. Through gritted teeth, she agrees to a story time. The histories tell us that Commander Voss, Jastil Kithrak, pierced Prince Orpheus clean through with his sword of silver, that his flesh was torn and fed to the great red dragon of Felamon. Blacketh's faithful roar out this tale, but beneath the roars, we hear whispers carrying truth and prophecy. The Prince of the Comet is not dead. The Prince of the Comet will come again. The Prince of the Comet will liberate us from Blacketh's tyranny. Praise be to Mother Gith, Queen of the One Sky. Praise be to your son, Orpheus, the true heir. Prince of the Comet. It's clear Lazel finds this text to be blasphemous heresy. While I have no strong opinions about it, since none of this seems to pertain to me yet, I do insist she at least considers that the story could be true. She disregards this, stating I sound like Voss, accusing Blacketh of the unthinkable. But really, I'm just team whoever can help me survive and thrive. 
with Balthazar's chamber sufficiently snooped, I decide to snoop about the rest of the castle. We now have more information about the Relic Night Song, but I still aim to uncover more about my past here and find Minthara. I decide to seek out Minthara first in the prison below the towers. We find her being tormented by two deep gnome cultists, chastising her for becoming distracted on her mission for the relic. They also note her unexpected weakness, a longing for affection and acceptance. She tries to break free of the torment, shouting that they don't have the right. When they insist they have every right, her mind reaches out to mine. I'm able to see her mind slowly disintegrating, and if I'm to have this woman as an ally, I can't allow this. The questioner's attentions turn to me, and after asking what it is they're doing, they state that they're erasing her. I intimidate them to stand aside, as I'm the one taking charge here, and they stand by to observe. While this is not necessarily ideal, I reach out to her mind regardless, and I'm swept into its psionic vortex. At the center of this storm, we see Minthara's mental defenses being stripped away by her torturers, exposing her to what is perhaps the absolute. I push past the unknown presence, finally reaching the nexus of her mind. She's a heap of raw emotion and shattered memories, but senses my arrival. She seems relieved and expresses that she prayed I would come, but further laments that there are no gods left to her now. Minthara seems all too aware now that whatever has been speaking to her is no god. It's nearly destroyed her, but it fears me. I tell her I have a plan. Because I can't risk blowing my cover in Moonrise, I tell her to fake obedience, and the guards will leave without raising the alarm. She's incredibly grateful, and although she would rather fight everyone right now, she trusts I'm making the right decision. As we release from one another's mind, the questioner asks if it is done, noting she didn't feel Minthara's mind break. I use intimidation to say I reshaped her, and if it's breaking she desires, I'll snap her like a twig. The other Inquisitor becomes fearful, stating her sister only meant to compliment my delicate work. As the guards leave, Minthara is disgusted to see her enemies live, but I ensure her we will get our revenge in due time. We make haste towards the exit. But before we make it out of Moonrise, we're stopped by the guards outside. They inform us the general ordered that she was to be repurposed, not freed, but I persuade them she's completely loyal to me, and I'll keep her in line. Although skeptical of her loyalty, they allow us to go as long as we keep her on a tight leash. As we make our way off the premises, Minthara and I have a word. She recounts that she last left Moonrise, a commander in the Absolute's army. Now she leaves as an exile, but is eternally grateful we rescued her. Suddenly, the artifact connects the two of us. In an instant, Minthara is able to see our adventures with the Prism, our dream visitor, and the power that keeps us protected from the Absolute. With her mind now free from the Absolute's grasp, she accepts the truth, says there's much to discuss, and asks if we have a safe place to camp nearby. I tell her where to find it and meet her there shortly after, where she's already made quite the cottage core setup. She thanks me once again for freeing her and for allowing her to stay. Now that she's protected from the Absolute's hive mind, her memories begin to return to her, each more disturbing than the last. She's unsettled by the things she did in the name of the Absolute, and by the things done to her. 
I tell her someone in the cult is responsible for not only breaking her mind, but mine as well, and we will have our revenge. Together we plot to eradicate them, starting with Ketherick Thorm. I tell her I'm looking forward to having her as an ally, and she begins to reminisce about our time together in the Grove. I express that I don't know much about her, but she recalls that being with me was the first time she was able to be herself since the Absolute took hold. She connects with my mind to show me all that she is. Dangerous, cunning, wounded, brutal, paranoid, and fiercely loyal to those she trusts. It appears I've earned that trust along with a small measure of her affection, which is precious and rare. She goes on to state that together we can have our vengeance on those who infected us, but for now, it's time to rest. I'm not that sleepy yet though, so I ask what she knows about Catherick. She confirms our findings in Balthazar's chamber, that he likely draws his power from the relic in Thorm's mausoleum. She insists we must find the necromancer and claim what he seeks or destroy it. Now having a plan for the battles ahead, I decide to end the day. As night falls, Astarian seeks a word with me. He's been pondering the runes Casador carved into his back, becoming more and more certain they could be a way for his former master to dominate him still. I become a little peeved when he goes on to deduce the runes must be an infernal. Even though I'm a Cambian and already told him that, I tell him I would be happy to take another look at them, you know, being able to read infernal and all, but he thinks I'm just trying to get him out of his shirt. He digs the knife in a bit deeper when he says he needs someone with a little more expertise. I suppose I'm not a demony enough demon for him, so he suggests we speak with Raphael. Shoveling down my ego, I ask if he's willing to pay the price, and he states that we won't know until he asks. Unfortunately for him, since Raphael is such a character, he sort of comes and goes as he pleases, so we will have to keep our ears peeled for any horrendous poetry. Just saying, I would have done it instantly, for free, without unsolicited poetics, but sure, that's fine. I'm not bitter about it at all. I head to bed, but once again, who am I to be worthy of deep rest, and I'm awoken in the astral realm? To make matters worse, the dream visitor is wearing the silliest outfit I have ever seen. I mean, the cut isn't so bad, but purple really isn't his color. He seems exhausted by our proximity to the Absolute. It's becoming harder and harder for him to fight off the enigmatic voice that commands authority. That paired with the constant battle he faces against whoever he stole his power from has resulted in a very tired boy. He goes on to say, the order for my transformation has been given many times, and I make it a point to ask why I should believe him on that. He claims once more, he's the only one who can resist the Absolute's influence. Because of this, the Absolute is becoming desperate. Thankfully, I have successfully shown our loyalty to the cult of the Absolute, but in order to gain even more access, we will need to prove ourselves to Catherick Thorm. The conversation ends as he needs some much-needed rest, and asks that we do not let his efforts be in vain. The next morning, Shadowheart expresses gratitude I've accepted her for the whole Shar worshipping, and in earning her trust, there's more she wants to share. She seeks to serve Shar as a dark justicier. I ask why she would keep such an ambition a secret, and she goes on to say dark justiciers aren't widely considered to be the most fun company. 
She also, however, notes that she simply forgot she had this desire until recently. Now, she can ignore it no longer. As the conversation proceeds, she tells me about her mother superior, who often ignored her ambitions, and she hopes that if she succeeds in her mission to reach Baldur's Gate, that her time will soon come. Being cut from a bit of a dark cloth myself, I don't mind. Thank her for sharing, and head out for the day. With Minthara safely escorted out of the towers, we can proceed back in order to discover any more hidden secrets about my dark lineage. The first clue we come across is a naked cat by the name of Steelclaw, who claims at one point in my forgotten life, I kicked her. I inform her my past evils are a mystery to me, in hopes of learning more, but she seems preoccupied with nearby rats. The next person we come across is a drow by the name of Arash, who describes herself as a traitor in blood. She seems very pleased to not only make my acquaintance, but a Starian's. I ask her what her interest is in my pale friend, and she makes it very clear she wants him to bite her because a Starian for once doesn't even seem to enjoy this idea. I tell her he says no, and there's nothing more to discuss. What kind of weirdo would want a vampire to bite them? Not me. Moving on, we stumble across a super strange fleshy doorway, which seems to be a result of something from the rafters above. Investigating these rafters results in the discovery of a cracked wall. Within it, there's something shifting and crawling, very much alive. I do what any other smart woman would do, and plunge my arm inside. I can sense the presence in my mind becoming louder, feeling closer, so I decide to go limp, in hopes this might bring me one step closer to an audience with the absolute. This actually freed me from the wall, so to all of my companions' dismay, I try again. Without hesitation this time, I'm suddenly warped elsewhere. The presence no longer feels as if it's approaching. It's here. The words of the Absolute jolt through me. Disgraced. Master. Heir. Tyrant. Dark urge. Fallen one. Returns. The voice of the Absolute seems to revere me, and goes on in its language of broken words to say, Gave us everything. Disappeared. It pauses, as if struggling to communicate in terms that I can understand. In time, a floating, tentacled creature emerges before me. Unfortunately, due to my wings, I'm unable to see it for long. It explains this is the voice that was given to them in order to speak to my kind without breaking us. It describes that it was once a servant of the Grand Design. Now it's a slave to someone else's. It seems I was once the jeweled hope for that someone's design, but now I am their flaw. I ask who they are. The creature says I abandoned it, and left it to become a slave to the Chosen in order to bind this world. But it cannot bind me. As the artifact emerges, the creature beckons me to come to it, so that it can become itself once more. It begins to encircle me, growing louder, repeating the words, come and become, come and become as I fade back to the room. My companions seem to be in pain from the overwhelming voice of the Absolute, and Gail begs me to release myself, being ever so curious about what it means to become though. I save the game, and choose to submit. What lies ahead shall be an adventure for next time. Thank you so much for tuning in, 
and for all of your patience as I spend a great deal of time on these videos. I also want to extend a special thank you to all of my first patrons. The Patreon makes all of this possible, and gives members a behind-the-scenes look into what I'm working on, early access to videos, and even fun exclusive videos that would not work out so well on the channel. I'll even say the names of my top patrons at the end of every video. So a massive thank you to Brayden R and Game Ender. In the next Baldur's Gate video, we will finish our adventure in Act 2, and maybe even tiptoe into Act 3. Let me know in the comments down below if that's something you're still as excited about as I am. Sweet dreams, and I look forward to seeing you next time.